introduce our next speaker. Uh, you probably know don't you probably know him, but if you don't, uh, please set and force to one. Uh, don't make Sorry. him a set. Uh, <laughs> so this is Daniel, and he will tell you something about uh, news in some news in containers. Okay, can you hear me in the back? Okay. All right, great. Okay, we're going to, um, obviously, all you're really here to hear about SD Linux, right? Everybody's, oh, no, Docker and stuff, huh? Okay, we're going to talk about containers. And uh, if you went to Alex's talk the other day, that was really Docker based. This one's more about the technology that we're using underneath the covers. It's going to talk about different use cases. Uh, this is the talk. Um, the talk I'm giving is actually what we've been giving to our high-touch high beta customers, basically our most important customers. Um, although I, I'll speed it up a little bit and we'll get more into the darker stuff that I think people are more interested in at this point. But I'd like to give you more founding of what the technologies are that are involved in there. Usually when I start talking about containers, the first thing I say is the kernel knows nothing about containers. All right, so from the kernel's point of view, there's no such thing as a container. Well, we're taking advantage of the parts of the operating system, putting them together in what a user space is defining as a container. <coughs> so if you look at the evolution of the operating system from RHEL 4, at RHEL 4 time, everything was sort of processes on using the existing user space on the system. Uh, there was nothing virtualized. It was sort of just sta standard, the same way we've been doing computing since 1950s almost. You know, a little bit more technology, but, uh, well, other than IBM, they did virtualization back then. i got to give them credit. Uh, but basically, for Linux and Unix, it's always the same up to RHEL 4. RHEL 5 and 6, we moved to virtualization, but we were virtualizing the operating system. Okay, so virtualization of the operating system, obviously a huge success. VMware, great success with it. We've, Red Hat said some very good success with uh, virtualizing the operating system. But in a lot of ways, virtualizing, what people want to do is they want to virtualize applications, right? They, they, they don't want to necessarily run an entire another operating system. They want to run two instances of Apache. Um, or they want to run, you know, multiple instances. Or you get towards like an OpenShift environment where you're running hundreds of applications, really multi-tenant environments. Um, but for the most part, you know, most customers are looking at running uh, several containers or several um, applications uh, on the same box, so they really don't want to be managing operating systems. So you know, management of operating systems is expensive. So as we go to RHEL 7 in the current Fedoras, we have basically the ability to do both virtualization of the operating system and now virtualization of the containers, right, of the applications. So uh, when we talk about containers now, we're, uh, we're really trying to guide it towards lightweight application containment. Uh, so really looking at more of the application running than sort of s some people, I know like Leonard talks about system D N spawn lot, booting up uh, Debian under the covers. That's really not what we're after here. We're really after just the application, virtualizing the applications. So one of the things when we talk about uh, containers with our customers, everybody has a different definition of containers, okay? I believe uh, Google released a product that they call it their containing product, and all it really does is set up C groups. Okay, so it's doing resource containment. So I would argue that right, just setting up a resource containment is a container. Okay, so we're just talking about how am I going to control my processes? How am I going to group my processes and take away, you know, control them in some kind of containment? Um, so with uh, now current Fedoras and stuff like that, we've gotten really good tools for doing C groups. Back in RHEL 6, we had kind of crappy tools for doing containment, or for doing C groups. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as we go through. Um, making multi-tenants is easy. Right now, OpenShift is, is really kind of cool that we've been able to do that with RHEL 6, but we're really only taking uh, advantage of a couple of containment technologies, right? We're taking advantage of SC Linux for, uh, for process separation and some kind of hiding of the other processes on the system. And then we're taking care of what's file system namespace for separation of the temp. But we're not really taking the full advantage of what we, what's available in the kernel. And we're hoping we're, as we get to RHEL 7 environments that we'll take a lot more advantage of some of the more advanced containment. Um, you know, we want to be able to do secure sandboxing of applications. Um, we want to do uh, VN, 
basically similar things we were able to do with virtual machines, but without the overhead. And we want to make it SE Linux easier to use. I've heard some people say that it might be a little difficult to use it. But <laughs> don't really understand why. But. Okay, so we'll, we're going to look at use cases now. These are the use cases and different ways you want to use a computer system. So the first use case we're talking about is basically what I call generic application containment. Um, and these are th things where we're sharing the host operating system. So the containers are going to share the host operating system. We want to basically have everybody have the same slash user, but basically have, potentially have different slash vars, different slash etsies, um, or just be you know, resource constrained. So uh, examples of containment in this use case is, you know, I want to run my MariaDB with only two gigabytes of memory. I don't want the thing going over two gigabytes. Uh, I want to run my Apache with private temp. Um, I want to eliminate the network from my, I have an application that doesn't use the network, why is the network even present in that application's world view? Can I eliminate that? Um, and then I just want to run a random application, and I, I, I downloaded this application, I'm a little nervous of what it's going to do, and I just want to wrap it in a, in a confinement and run it and see what it does, but not have it screw up my machine. So then, uh, so that's simple containment, using sharing the host operating system, but what about more advanced ones, like I want to run uh, multiple, uh, multiple applications all sharing the same uh, user space. So in this case, we're talking about running, say, three or four JBoss applications all in their own um, Apache instances and separated on, a, say, a demilitarized zone. So these are, custom, these are actual things that our customers have asked us. I want to run two Postgres SQLs at the same time, perhaps listening on different ports, perhaps listening on the same port on the same machine. Just have multiple databases um, with different configuration files. But in the, both of these cases, we really want to run multiple services, not multiple operating systems together. As we go down through the use cases, now the next use case is basically now we're going to get away from shared host operating system, but we want to have our own sort of user space with us. And this is really where the Docker stuff starts to come in. So in this case, we want to boot potentially different operating systems. Say I want to boot a Fedora operating system on top of a RHEL, 6, a RHEL 7 box. Perhaps I want to boot a RHEL 6 uh, uh, operating system on top of RHEL 7. Um, the next case is the Cherooted application containment. Cherooted application containment is basically just what it sounds like. In this case, we're running an application instead of an entire operating system. So I want to run a Fedora application on RHEL, uh, on RHEL 7. We had a customer came to us, and what they, they actually were an Ubuntu customer that wanted to run, um, they were doing long-term support on uh, Ubuntu, and they wanted to run the latest Ubuntu uh, user space inside a containment so that they could get great, uh, say, the, a new version of glibc that would help them speed up their, it was a stock trading company. They wanted to get a couple extra trades per nanosecond through. So they actually were looking at that use case, and they found that Ubuntu support for their underlying operating system wasn't very good. So they came to Red Hat and asked for, they basically said, I want RHEL underneath the covers, and I want Fedora user space. So they want to run a, uh, secure, I mean a, a securely um, supported file system you know, with all the advanced file systems, the best kernels uh, as far as support, but then run really advanced user spaces on top of it. So that's that, uh, for, for other applications. So when we get a look at containers, we look at four key technologies. Um, we look at, we, uh, to make up a container, you, get, you have to either have resource constraints, process isolation, security, um, and then you need some kind of tool to manage it, right? You need some kind of tool, really, to configure the whole thing. I would argue that any one of these gives you containment. So you don't need all three of them, but if you want to get to, say, the ideal containment environment, you want to have all three. C groups. Everybody in the room knows about C groups, right? They've been around for a long time. You know what they do? They basically control CPU, memory usage, disk usage, network usage, uh, and you can sort of set limits on processes. The problem is in RHEL 6 environments, when you did this, you actually had to move PIDs around, right? You had to use this weirdo file system um, under, uh, underneath slash sys uh, C groups and move files into it. <coughs> the other problem with it is that there's no control, right? If you had two applications that want to configure C groups, they would fight each other. 
So people would say, I want to have all my processes have 20% of the CPU, and then someone would install an application and said it needed to have 40% of the CPU, and you didn't have any control any way of see, controlling that. So anyway, it was sort of the wild, wild west of setting up the C group file system. Um, so Leonard and Kai and the system D guys went and talked to the kernel guys, and they're basically trying to straighten this out. And the kernel is moving towards a single writer mode. What single writer mode means is the first one that opens up the C group um, socket, he owns it. And guess what? PID 1 is going to open it. So no one else is going to be able to do anything. So you're all going to have to work through PID 1 to, the, to manage your C group for the future. In RHEL 7, we want that, to, while the kernel isn't enforcing it, we want all applications to follow the rules. So um, in the future, the uh, kernels will enforce it, but right now they don't. But by convention, we want everybody talking to system D when they want to configure C groups. So system D can basically control it and understand what's going on in the system. Another uh, <coughs> new concept that system D has brought into the system is this thing called scopes and slices. Everybody hear of scopes and slices? All right, a little bit. Basically, what scopes and slices does is system D understands processes. So it's starting up all the services on the system. Um, it uh, is a system D um, uh, logging program that basically when you log in, it registers you as a user with system D. Um, and when machines start or containers start, they also register with system D. What system D does then is it actually creates a, a C group with no resource controls but puts your process into the C group. When your processes or sub processes are in the C group, it basically, you know, it sets up what is a, a fair sharing algorithm between all the processes. This means that if I started up Apache, Apache service will go into the Apache C group. If I set, start up MariaDB, the MariaDB process goes into a C group. If I, uh, Apache forked off 1,000 processes and MariaDB only forked off three, in a RHEL 6 system, uh, Apache would have 1,000 one th uh, resources and MariaDB would only have three. So all those processes would take priority over it. In RHEL 7 system, all those processes get the share of the system that the Apache container gets. So it's on equal parts. And now the, now the MariaDB database will get the same share of the operating system as all the processes under Apache. Similar, if I log into a system, I get put into a container. So no user in the system can dominate the system. So they basically set it up so out of the box, everybody uses C groups. If you're running Fedora now, you're getting that. If you went into this uh, system D CGLS, it'll show you everybody in your system is contained out of the box in a fair share algorithm. You can also go into the system then and, and, and configure resource constraints on any one of those C groups. So if you wanted to say Dan Walsh gets only 20% of the CPU shares, you can do that, and then the other users would have more priority over him. The beauty of this is that now I can go into unit files and basically configure unit files with C group constraints instantaneously. So I can go into my MariaDB and I can say with a one, one simple line that MariaDB only gets two gigabytes of memory, and that's it. It's, con it's contained. So it's a nice, simple way of, of handling the system. Um, and so we go back to our original uh, use cases here. System D, uh, if I wanted to uh, say MariaDB, I could set the memory limit equals one gigabyte, and System D would take care of configuring that and making it happen. The blue line up there actually shows a command line that you can execute that will actually configure uh, Apache to only have uh, 524 shares of the system and memory limit of uh, half, a, half a gig. Uh, the way CPU shares work is 1024 is considered the uh, what everybody gets, so you're going to get half of the CPU uh, of, of other processes. Uh, when you use libvirt for launching containers, it automatically puts your process into a C group. Uh, what we're doing with Docker now is we're actually moving to a similar model, but what we want with Docker is to have the C group that your process gets stuck into to be a child of whoever started it. Okay, so we don't want to necessarily take advantage of the machine slice. What we want to do is if I start up a, a Apache container under a service file, we want the Apache process's containment to be underneath that C group constra constraint. So now the system ad admin goes in and he sets those rules in the unit file. It needs to apply to the container. So it, it just it makes sense. So that's the use case. It's namespaces. 
I talked last year about namespaces. I'm going to go through them really, really fast. It's a, somewhat of a hard concept to understand, but basically namespaces are really sort of the bread and butter of, of what people are thinking about Docker and other type of containers. So namespaces is a way the kernel has for a uh, process to change its worldview. So a process is basically voluntarily saying, I want to change the worldview of my process versus my parents' process. There's a whole bunch of different uh, namespaces available. There's five of them that we're taking advantage of right now inside of Docker and Birth Sandbox. Um, there's the IPC namespace, the net na uh, PID namespace, the mount namespace, the net namespace, the UTS namespace. I'm going to go through them all in a minute. Uh, in future, in RHEL 7, we're going to have the user namespace, and user namespace is now turned on in Rawhide. So when Fedora 21 comes out, you will be able to use the user namespace. PID namespace is just basically pro uh, your PIDs start counting again from zero or from one. So the first process that gets launched inside of a container or na a process that changes proc namespace is going to be PID one. Outside of the names, outside of the namespace or in the root namespace of the system, your process actually gets created with a different PID. Okay, so your process on the system might be process five thousand, but inside of the namespace, it's going to be PID one. So the kernel is sort of lying to you while you're in it. The nice thing here is that you can't see any other processes on the system. As far as if you do a PS command inside of one of these containers, from your point of view, you're going to see just your processes or just the processes in the container. So you can't break out and, and interfere with other processes, or you can't easily break out and uh, interfere with other processes. Mount namespace been used for years. We used it in RHEL 5 for uh, PAM uh, namespace. Uh, if you've ever played with the SC Linux Sandbox, it uses it in uh, RHEL 6, um, and it will be used in RHEL 7. But basically what it allows you to do is change your mount table. So you can mount new file systems over existing file systems or existing inodes and actually have a different worldview of your file system layout. The standard case is the slash temp, uh, where we bind mount over it so we can have, say, all the users on the system have different slash temps from each other. Um, again, mount namespace uh, works. Uh, well, that's, that pretty much explains it. Network namespace is kind of a uh, <coughs> new and exciting one, or uh, not too many people have used it yet, but it allows you basically to set up a new networking stack inside of your container or inside of your namespace. Basically, you can have different IP rules, you can have uh, different IP address, you can have different routing tables, you can have different um, uh, IP tables, net filter rules set up for the interfaces inside of your container, and you can have a private loopback uh, interface. Um, so with, again, with, uh, it's, it's really kind of cool, but basically you can eliminate your process's view of the regular network, you will get a private network. You can also eliminate the network altogether. So this is when we talked about our use cases earlier. If I want to run a process out of system D, I want to turn off network. So if it's a process that just, you know, say my MySQL just uh, shares locally, and there's no reason for it to see the network, I don't want the thing accidentally to, cre to come up and start listening on the network by some configuration error, I can eliminate its network from its worldview. UTS namespace sort of plugs in with the uh, network namespace. UTS namespace just lets you set up a host, different host name for a process. So if I get, and you really kind of need that. Say you're going to run SSH daemon inside of a uh, container, you really need the SSH daemon to look up its host name so it can, part of its protocol is to talk to the other end. So you probably want your host names inside your container to match the IP addresses that they're, they're being handed. IPC namespace is just uh, message queues, semaphores, um, and shared memory. Basically, you get a whole new set of these. You don't see anybody else's outside of your container, and your process inside of the container. It can share it. You can have the same names as other um, IPC namespaces on the system. So if you add names, semaphores, um, you can reuse the names, but only inside of your container. User namespace is the one that's somewhat controversial. Right? So when user namespace was first coming out, the people that were doing it believed that they should allow a non-privileged user to start up a user namespace. And the security community went nuts. Okay? The problem with that is the kernel get, can get confused. The goal of the user namespace is actually to have UID zero inside of the namespace. So you can have privileges inside of your namespace. 
And think about it, it makes sense because you want to basically allow a process inside of the namespace to configure its namespace network. So if you're booting up, you want to have UID 0 inside of your container have some privileges, but you only want it privileged inside of the container. Right? So what they do with user namespace is they actually, similar to the PID namespace, is you set up a mapping. So you have UID 0 inside of the namespace, might be UID 5000 outside of the namespace. So it's a little clunky right now, and we're just starting to play with it. But the goal here is to have, you know, again, you would have privileges inside. If you understand the way capabilities work in Linux, Linux capabilities are an attempt to break down the power of root on the system. So right now there's about 36, 37 different capabilities available on the system. Things like I need the capability to bind to ports less than 1024, or I need to be able to open up a raw IP socket. So there's different rules governing those. Inside with the user namespace, what they did is they actually set up namespace-based capabilities instead of system-based capabilities. So what you can do is uh, if you, you can give capabilities inside of your namespace that aren't available outside of your namespace. And that's the goal with the user namespace. In Rawhide, we've changed it so it only can be started by a non-privileged user. I mean, a, <laughs> a privileged user. So, so basically, if you're root and you want to set up a namespace environment, you can set up the user namespace. And from a security point of view, I think it's pretty good. All right, I think it's a, a step in the right direction because we do have some isolation. We are trying to build up another barrier. And with security, you always want to ma add as many layers as possible. So that's the last one. Uh, right now in RHEL 7, it is turned on in the kernel, but off in user space. That means that if you call the unshare syscall, which is the way you set up a namespace, the unshare syscall will not allow you to set the user namespace. But we have it on in the kernel because we want it to be ABI compatible. So as the RHEL 7 kernel goes, so the goal is hopefully at RHEL 7.1, we're confident enough to allow the user namespace to be turned on. If the user namespace gets turned on, I can actually tighten the SE Linux policy for what contains applications. Because right now I have to give capabilities, the capabilities in order to run inside of the user namespace have to be real capabilities as opposed to namespace capabilities. The kernel guys have to give me the power to do this too, but okay, so that's. Any question on namespace? That's probably the most complicated part. Yes, Steve. I mean, I, I think we're going to have that problem. That's uh, yeah, the, the question is, his question was uh, basically asking about running out of user UIDs. So, you know, as, as um, you know, we start to use these, say, you, say OpenShift's going to run a thousand of these containers um, on a box at a time, you know, what happens when we use a namespace? You know, we're going to give them each one of them two, two UIDs? I, I don't know. Right. It's, it's, confu it's going to be real confusing. As I said, we're just beginning to experiment. We haven't really even experimented with it yet, right? No one's, none of our container technology, Docker and Vert Sandbox, both don't turn on the technology at this point. Don't know. Any kernel guys answer that? Uh, what is it? Uh, how many UIDs are supported now? 65,000? What about KD bus? What about it? Yeah, I mean, what, what we can do with these namespaces, right now in a, say, a Docker environment uh, or invert sandbox, you're able to bind mount, say, sockets into the container. So I, I won't have time to demo it today, but I've actually demoed, uh, say, putting dev log into the container and then having syslog messages go out. Similarly, we bind mounted vert, uh, triple SD into the container and actually been, had full authorization going on inside of the container talking to the socket. So really, KD bus will be the same thing. KD bus will understand that you're coming from a container and, and will look at you. It'll see your real UID, not the fake UID, and it'll see your real PID, not the fake PID. So all the information will go out correctly out of the container. But it's up to the administrator to basically say, 
I want to allow this type of communication to come out. I, I, I would think they could be. Katie bus doesn't really exist in the real world yet, so I mean, it exists on Lettuce Machine. So, yeah, you got an answer, Alex? So you get set up as a, uh, yeah. I, I think I think KD bus is going to make this stuff uh, hopefully a lot nicer. Uh, but people got to realize is Docker is like play 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 doh right now. I mean it's just so early that you know trying to answer these questions right right now uh, right now they're sort of concentrating just at the network level. I mean they have plans to to use these new communications. So right now it's sort of like bind mount something in and you can use it or I set up little VPNs between them, um, network communication. Okay, I'm gonna, <laughs> we're never gonna get through these. You're never gonna see Docker if you keep asking. Yeah, one last one. No, well, if you're, if you're in a container, if you, if, you are, if you are in a different PID namespace, no, you won't be able to see who's using up the CPU. But if you are root, root on a system, you'll be able to see the processes inside of the container that are using up. Right, a privileged user on the system will be able to see all processes on the system. So if there's one process that's using 100% CPU, um, you'll be able to see it. So you'll be able to shoot the containers in the head if you want to shoot them in the head. Uh, I got lots of videos that actually show this stuff actually happening. It would take way too long to show them now. If you go to that site, uh, people.red uh, Fedora Project, as a matter of fact, I think I blogged this one. If you follow my blog at danwalsh.livejournal, uh, there's three others. This one shows namespaces. There's another one that shows for a sandbox tooling, not Docker. I'm going to work on the Docker one. And there's another one that shows security. So with these, these namespaces, again, we're not getting to Docker yet, but uh, in System D right now, you can set up namespaces. So you can actually go and just set up one line into your unit file to say private temp, and then all of a sudden the, uh, that application gets its own version of slash temp, and that's different than all the users. So the users can access the slash temp. One of the most common types of CVEs, security vulnerabilities, is processes being stupid about their con creating content in slash temp. For years, I've been trying to tell any service person that you write in slash run, users write in slash temp, but there's lots of bad applications. So back in Fedora 16, 17, somewhere around there, we actually did an effort to get more and more system processes that were using slash temp to set them up with private te slash temp. Apache being the number one one, and now if you run Apache, its slash temp is different than your slash temp on the system, um, and that's because you're going to probably run some bad PHP app on there that's going to end up causing trouble that a user could, do, could, could attack. Similarly, if you just set a private network, that eliminates the network. So if you set the private network inside of your name, uh, inside of your unifile for any service, it loses the ability to see the network. I think it gets just local host. So when we're looking at this, we look at security. The original talk, I think, on the schedule is called Secure Linux Containers. Really, secure Linux containers, they ain't all that secure. <laughs> OK? Uh, so if, if you're comparing virtualization to, to the security of Linux uh, containers, and you really care about it, virtual machines are better. Because in order to break out of a virtual machine, I got to break through the kernel, then I got to break through the hypervisor level, then I got to break through SVIRT, if that's the Linux wrapping it then I can attack the host operating system kernel. So I got to go through all those steps to get to the attack point. Linux containers, you're talking to the kernel. If there's a kernel vulnerability, you can attack it. Also, remember I told you the kernel doesn't understand containers. All it understands is namespace. Guess what? The whole system is not namespaced. SE Linux is not namespaced. C groups, not namespaced. Lots of parts of the, uh, a lot of stuff in slash sys, not namespaced. So if a process inside of a container can do something evil, and he's running his route, he can get out. 
right? You can break out. So what we want to do is we want to add things like use the namespace. We want to wrap them in SE Linux. We want to eliminate certain capabilities from the container. We want to do as much as possible to try to contain that application, but you should always just think of that application running there, especially if it's running as root, as it owns your system. All right, we're trying to do our best, but it's, you know, we're really, this thing is, is pretty privileged. Everybody seen the SE Linux uh, coloring book? So there's a link there. You can go on and see coloring book. Hopefully at the summit we'll actually have coloring books we can hand out, but they wouldn't give me a budget to give them to you guys. <laughs> so there's actually an SE Linux uh, document that uses cartoons to explain how it works. So, um, But basically with um, 